Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 33 of Confessions of the Market Makers. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. The Safado. <laughs> and I'm joined here by my cultivated co-host, former market maker of 20 years and present-day retail trader. He wasn't educated at Warden. He wasn't educated at Harvard. He came up in the mud as a hustler on Howe Street. The man who's smoother than Godiva chocolate. I'm talking about JJ. JJ, how's it going? Good, Ray. How you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. A little, uh, still a little stir crazy here, man. I'm ready for all this to end. <laughs> so today our guest was a specialist and a market maker for the Dow and S&P stocks on the New York Stock Exchange for 25 years. For the past 10 years, he's been successfully trading his own portfolio, specializing in SPY ETF and its options. Hailing from Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> market up or market down, he wears the crown. I'm talking about Paul Asmar. Paul, how's it going? Uh, it's going well. Thanks, Ray. Hi, JJ. Hey, great to, be to have here. you. Thanks a yes. lot. Yes, pleasure. Pleasure on, Paul. How, how are you holding up in quarantine? Holding up okay. You know, when you're sitting here trading seven hours a day, you're kind of in quarantine anyway. Um, <laughs> right, right. But, yeah, you know, I'm lucky enough being in South Carolina now. When the day's done, just go sit outside and chill out. The weather's beautiful. So um, it hasn't been that bad. Yeah, great, great. You know, you know, like I mentioned, you're from, you're from Brooklyn. I, I didn't know South Carolina. You know, usually Florida is the, the migration spot for New Yorkers. I guess uh, South Carolina is becoming the hotbed now. South Carolina is definitely becoming a hotbed. I, I moved down here a little over five years ago. Uh, I tried to move down in 2008 after I left the trading floor, but it took uh, six years to conv convince my wife and uh, two of my daughters to come down. Um, but they love it since we've gotten down here. But the development we live in, and my wife actually works for the developer, there are a ton of people moving from the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. So many people from Long Island, where you're from, Mm -hmm. moving down here so it's gonna be funny trying to hear them say y'all with their new york accent <laughs> as they migrate down here <laughs> uh, that's funny that's funny how do, how do you find the uh, i guess the pace of living right i mean coming from brooklyn new york high pace you know what, what what's it like in south carolina like a little slower uh, i would imagine it's definitely a little slower i mean i love the old Charleston, charlestonian feel uh when you go to downtown charleston and some of the neighborhoods still Mm -hmm. But there is such, it's becoming a transient area, especially Mount Pleasant, because so many people that work for Boeing and the hospitality industry and the uh, healthcare industry. So it's really branching out. So it's coming, becoming a little transient like Atlanta is. So you're getting a lot more different personalities and um, nationalities and everything down here. So I hope it doesn't lose all of its small time charm. Uh, it's still a slower pace in New York. I think everything would be, yeah, but awesome. it's, uh, it's, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. nice, nice. Awesome. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to pass it off to JJ. I'll let you start some of the questioning. Oh, great. Well, first of all, total honor to have you on the show, sir. I mean, oh, we, you. Uh, you know, we, we worked together a little bit in another room and, and that's when I got to know you. And, uh, and I just, you know, I really think it's, it's really good that people should understand how this business used to be and how it's changed and we don't really get to talk to many people who are on the floor anymore um you don't really see a lot of especially you know on twitter and things like that you don't see a lot of people who are specialists uh there's a b bunch of guys from chicago around so it's really nice because you know you were at the sort of you know you were a part of history and uh so you know i just wanted to you know, bring you out and get you exposed to, to people and find out, and you know, they, they should find out what real traders used to be like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, let me start off by asking you, how did, how did you get started in this crazy business? Well, uh, it's, it's not an exciting story. I had gone to college. I went to a small college, downtown Brooklyn, St. Francis college, and I left college and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was bartending for six months. I was a business major, but you know, it, it's a little different now than to back then. I was living home. Yeah. And at the time, my wife, well, she was my girlfriend. My girlfriend's sister was working on the Florida Stock Exchange. And I had just gotten a job in the back office of Cowan and Company. Oh, wow. And those back office jobs were horrible back then. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Horrible. So 
she did not like to floor the exchange. So she asked me if I wanted to go down and interview. And I said, absolutely. And I went down there and the interview consisted of the head clerk of the specialist firm, just like rattling out numbers that I had to add and subtract and things like that. Really? <laughs> All really silly stuff. And then he says, do you want the job? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I remember going back to the guys that uh, later that day and telling the guy from Cowan, hey, I'm, you know, I got an opportunity on the Florida New York Stock Exchange. And he goes, you're going to be sorry. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and I gave my two weeks notice and he said, no, you can leave today. I said, that's even better. And I started the following week and it's, it was the greatest, greatest thing I ever did. Um, I started in March of 1983. There were no computers. It was all paper. You know, the average volume was, I don't know, 70 million shares a day total. Wow. wow. And I started off as a, a, back, a, a backup clerk where you, the orders would literally spit out of a machine, you know, to buy 500 shares of Exxon. And then you would tell your frontline clerk and then he would tell his broker, you know, that's, that's how slow paced it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, that's how I got down there. Um, it was a small firm at first. So to put things in perspective, there were 64 specialist firms when I started in 1983. When I left the trading, and there was probably five to 6,000 people overall on, on the floor. That's wow. brokers, clerks, uh, yeah. exchange personnel, you name it. When I left the end of 07, there were four or five specialist firms left mm -hmm. and maybe four to 500 people. Wow. And, and that's, that's, over um that was well my goodness it's it's going to be 13 years since october that i left so um it changed dramatically um so i was i was a clerk it was a small firm i worked for there were a lot of mom and pop specialist firms back yeah then. yeah you know it wasn't like spear leads spear leads was huge when I oh yeah them. they were a I force. finally went to them this was a small firm. It was called Ernst Holman's Ware and Keelum. So it was a joint account, four different people. There were like 10 brokers and 20 clerks. There were only 30 of us. Wow. But we had some of the biggest stocks in the world back then. We had Exxon. We had Compact Computer. Really? Which was huge back then. I Wells, remember, yeah. Wells Fargo, Bell South, Toys R Us, which was a growth stock back then. <laughs> That's true. It really was. So yeah. we had... You know, so we had some really great uh, stocks. We didn't have a lot of capital. You know, our firm was small, so we didn't have a lot of capital. So, um, you know, I mean, if you want me to keep talking, I will. Oh, yeah, how, please do. Yeah. How things evolved. So, so I was a clerk. I was actually the clerk, the trading assistant in Compact Computer. And I really, like, made my name in, during the 87 crash. Okay. Compact was one of the busiest stocks then. And remember back then, stocks didn't clear. So I think it was, was it three days or five days. It was Today, T plus five, wasn't it? And then I, they changed I, I, it to three. Right. So when you think about it, like, so during the crash, Compact Computer went from like $130 down to like 60. Yeah. So five days later, if you had an error. <laughs> oh, yeah. You didn't know about it for five days. That's uh, right. That's right. So. Right. I was very fortunate. I was very good at what I did and we didn't have errors and, and I was very, uh, very adept at, ha at helping my specialist broker. So that really started making my career. Um, okay. Because I, again, there was, a, there was a lot of nepotism, especially yep. in small firms. Yeah. So they got their badges first. Oh, okay. It took me a while. I didn't get my badge to 1993. It took me 10 oh, years. Really? Yeah, because it was a small firm. So, oh, yeah. You know, one, one senior partner had two sons. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they, they were coming out ahead of me. <laughs> and it's funny you say that because I was in New York for the very first time in my life in 94. And uh, we were, I, I was selling advertising for public companies. And we were at this thing called the Discovery Expo. And mm -hmm. it was at the, um, I think it was the, the Grand Hyatt. And, uh, this guy came up and he was wearing, you know, my partner was there. My partner ended up being head trader for Raymond James, but we were both, you know, just rookies hadn't even gotten to the business. And this guy walks up and he's wearing this cashmere overcoat 
you know, Brioni suit, just, you know, like just money. Right. right. And uh, my buddy goes to him. So what do you do? He goes, well, I'm a specialist on the floor. <laughs> And my buddy goes, oh, really? So how do you know? How do you become a specialist? And he looks at him and he goes, if you have to ask, you'll never be one. And then he turned and walked away. And we were like, wow, <laughs> you know, thanks for the tip. Jeez, you know. Oh, no, then he said, oh, yeah, you know, clerks make seven figures a year. And then turned and walked away. So I don't know what for me worked at. We didn't even get that far. But so when I met you, when I actually got a job at the exchange and started meeting some of the specialists down there, I found that they were not like that at all. Like they were some of the nicest guys, like they were regular guys. It wasn't what you thought it would be at all. No, not at all. It was a great, it was a great community. I mean, we fought, we yelled at each other, you know, when, when we were trading, but at the end of the day, you'd go out and have a drink. Yeah. And and when somebody needed something, they would wheel around on top of a little, like little dolly with four wheels, a, a big garbage can. And you would fill that with thousands of dollars within an hour. Yeah. God forbid somebody's child was sick or something. It was the most generous community you ever find. And you never heard a lot about that though. Exactly. You only, only heard the bad things, you know, when, when specialists did something bad. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's what we used to say up in Vancouver. You'd say, you know, back in the day of fractions, you'd say, you know, we'd cut each other's heart out for an eighth. But uh, when your girlfriend throws you out of the house, there's always a place to crash, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> so so uh now uh, just talking about because now you've been uh, a lot of people don't really understand because now everything's electronic and you push a button and you get a fill mm-hmm. instantaneously but in the old days when you wanted to trade like say compact there was one guy that actually made the market in compact and that was a specialist on the floor you didn't have 20 or 30 different places that you could go to transact that that trade so you know, you were a part of some uh, some pretty, you know, historic um, IPOs probably. And, mm-hmm. you know, some of the ones that you've told me about. So we'll get you to talk about those a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, well, again, you're 100% to put things in perspective back in the back in the day. So any stock that traded down there, if you use Compact as an example, 95% of the volume and compact would go through us at the New York stock exchange. The other 5% would go out to those little regional exchanges in the Midwest, mm-hmm. California, this and that. And then out of that 95%, I'm going to say 30 to 35% was the specialist putting up his or her capital trading it throughout the day. Mm-hmm. So when there were no buyers or sellers, that's when we put up our capital. So like, you picture what happened back in February and March, we would have been long a lot of stock over there. Mm, yeah. And we would have taken a beating. But the good thing is, especially once, like, so back to the 87 crash quickly, at the end of that day, there were a lot of specialist firms that did not have enough capital to cover the amount of stock they were long. Mm-hmm. And that's when Spearleads and Kellogg went around and started loaning money. Um, and also, looking to take over firms yep. and that's how they grew okay. during those times. Yep. So, I mean, they were big help. They would lend, you know, they, so that, that was a big factor there. So whenever you traded a stock, 95% of the time, it was either through your broker. So you would call your broker. There was no computers at the time. So the broker yeah. would come walking over to us with the order in his hand. Or like I said, it was a, it was called a, uh, a dot machine, which stood for designated order turnaround. It would spit oh, out yeah. this little cardboard order would spit out of a machine. And, and that's how the order would come to us also. And then we wrote everything down. Like when you had a transaction, so somebody, you know, Maryland's came in and bought 500 shares of compact. That broker would give me Merrill Lynch and his badge number and the time of the trade. And I would give back, 500, you know, uh, Ernst and company with my broker's badge number. And this was all written down. Yeah. Every trade like that. Yeah. And it got put to the tape by somebody called a reporter who yep. would mark it on a little like, uh, IBM type card, like a, yep. you know, a push out card, like the SAT ones and then put yep. it in the machine. Yeah. That's how orders got executed. Hmm. So luckily in 87, half of our stocks had started to be put on computers. Okay. 
you know, and these computers were like the size of a, you know, an, an old, uh, an old car from the fifties. <laughs> so at least some of our stocks were on computers at the time of the crash. Um, but as far as IPOs and stuff, how IPOs work down there. So there were 64 specialist firms. Everybody wanted one. Yeah. Everybody wanted to get an IPO, but they would, we all got raided. So I, I was telling um, Ray earlier, we wore many hats. I had to make a market that pleased my company, the company I was representing, say Compact. I had to please the broker I just traded with. Mm -hmm. I had to make money <laughs> for my firm also, right? Yep. Trading. And then you would get raided. Every quarter, brokers got to rate you. Yeah. you know, and it was anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> So if they didn't like you, they would bash you. So if you didn't get good ratings, your firm would not be put up for oh, stock allocations. Got it. And then they would pick the five top rated firms to go for those interviews. Oh. Um, and I was very fortunate. Uh, I went for some big ones for us. I went when Conoco, Conoco, right? Conoco Phillips. Yep. yep. Conoco was part of DuPont. Mm -hmm. And when it split off in 1998, it was the largest IPO at the time ever. Yeah. And I interviewed for it and, and we, and I got it. It was very fortunate, fortunate to get it. Um, I also got the Chicago board of trade. That was one of the last ones I got back in, I think Oh five. Nice. When they went public. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty proud when you get those things. Yeah. No kidding. Eh? It's, <laughs> um, it's that, that's, that's quite an honor. It's great to be a part of history that way. It is met. Uh, you know, I, I became a floor official which at the time meant you had the ability and, and the authority if there was a trade dispute or if there was a trading breakout in the crowd where you would go in and, and manage it mm -hmm. and help the other uh, brokers, uh, you know, manage the trading breakout. So that was, that, that was pretty cool. That was an honor. Um, I, I ran a program for new specialists just the way I'm like trying to teach market profile now. I taught new specialists back at the time. Oh, okay. So, you know, that was, that was fun to do. Um, it was great. It was, it was a great place. I, the only other thing I would, would have wanted to be is probably a pro athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Which I knew that was never going to happen. So, <laughs> so this, this is the next best thing. Okay. Yeah. No kidding. That's uh yeah, that's pretty amazing. The it, it's, it's funny because I, I, you know, I kind of figured out back in March when, or, you know, February when this all fell apart, uh, you know, there, especially in, in, in these, in the equity market and the futures market, there's really not that many market makers left. I mean, I was a NASDAQ guy, so I worked with a lot of the guys on the spear leads floor that came over from Troster when you guys yeah. uh, acquired them, they were all my buddies. And, um, you know, back in the day, they used to have a thing called the red book, mm -hmm. which was like a directory of all the market makers. And it was thick. It was like a Bible. Now it'd be like a three page brochure. Um, you know, they, they got rid of so many, um, you know, specialists and market making firms and concentrated the liquidity so much that when we have a massive event, like we've had in the last, you know, two months, uh, the market makers are backing away and they're not absorbing inventory because, you know, there's just, the ranges are so big and there's just so few of them. And they just back away from risk like you wouldn't believe, like crazy now. So uh, a lot of people really didn't understand why why the ranges were so crazy and why the price action was, you know, was almost um, it was comical sometimes. You know, other than the fact that people were getting destroyed. Um, well, the fact that a couple of things, you know, I was telling Ray earlier, you know, the, the spy is trading like a penny stock and the CSP mm -hmm. five hundred. Um, you have to understand, I'm a, I don't know if this specialist system was still in place. If, you know, would the market have gone down as much? I have no idea. Eventually price will seek its level. Yeah. However, we would add a dampen volatility. We had guidelines. Yeah. So we had to, depending on the price of your stock, the volume it did and all those different types of things, you had to buy a certain amount of stock when the market went down, regardless. <laughs> yeah. Regardless. So on days like that, we'd be out a lot of money and long probably a million shares or more in some of our stocks. Oh, yeah, definitely. You, you should have seen what it took to open a bank stock down 
a certain amount. Yeah. I mean, now you see a bank stock open down 10%. It's nothing. Yeah. And here's the biggest thing. If we open a stock either up or down a, a large percentage, you had better not let it be trading back up to where it closed the night before. Oh, yeah, that's right. Anytime soon. Yeah. Because if you did, they would say you absolutely, like say, say we gapped the stock down $8 and I, I got the okay to do it and I bought, you know, a quarter of a million shares. And then a half hour later, that stock's only down $2. Yeah. People are going to be screaming. Oh, yeah. Screaming. I want price adjustment. You ripped me off. Exactly. Yeah. Now, look at how these things open. The SPY oh. opens down five dollars and it's unchanged within the first half hour <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's it's crazy it's it's because now we have so many of these uh you know prop guys and these large pools of money uh that are acting as market makers but they don't have our interests at heart at all and they have no responsibility to us absolutely not. you know so you know you're seeing you know, you're seeing like stop runs in Globex are now a part of the regular trading hours, right. you know, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's kind of kind of gone back to the wild west a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it sometimes, you know, me, I mean, I'm an ex manipulator and, and, and running markets and deals and things like that. And sometimes, you know, I'll be in the room and I'll go to Ray, I'll go, man, this is just, this is trading like one of my deals. It's, you know, it's a real head scratcher, you know, but it's, yeah. it's the most, you know, it's the most sophisticated market in the world, but it's trading like a bulletin board stock. You know, it's, it's a little, uh, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Algorithms do not make markets. Algorithms are there to just pick each other off left and right. When a stock is grinding higher, it's one algorithm picking off another one. That's all they are. Yeah. If, if anybody thinks like, when the market went down in, in, in February and March, that there's actually people putting in algorithms to support this market. They're sadly mistaken. Yeah. I mean, and most of those algorithms are, uh, are actually run by, um, you know, guys who are like, you know, ex Goldman, ex Morgan, and they have these prop firms or they basically, some of these guys are trading, you know, two, three, four hundred million dollars in the day time frame, and right. they write their own algorithms so they can, you know, on the ES, for example, they can take 2,000 contracts and split it up and hit so many different execution venues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so they're doing that and it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's tradable now, but there were, there were the first couple of weeks of, of, of when we came off that, boy, it was, you know, there, there was no price stability at all, um, you know. No, you, and you stay out of the way. Like I, I was telling Ray earlier, you know, you have to know, yeah, there's three things, especially now, like trading behind the screen. You have to know yourself best. Then you have to know the vehicle you trade. So you have to know the spy like the back of my hand. And third, and just as important in it as any of those, is know your competition. I know it's been short-term traders the last couple of days because they care about reference points and destinations. They set their algorithms to them. Yeah. March and February, when this market was just screaming down, Long-term traders getting out don't care about any of that stuff. Yeah, right, right. They're going to rip it right down, so they do not care. Definitely. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a different world. Um, you have to adapt. I was telling Ray earlier, I'm going to say most people that left the floor, I mean, they didn't leave it on their own accord. It just, the writing was on the wall. Things started to change. We started going into a hybrid market, half Half human, half machine. We went from eighths of a dollar to sixteenths to pennies. Mm -hmm. So your profit margins got squeezed both as a specialist and as it you used to be called a two dollar broker. I remember you, them, yeah. You got paid two dollars for every share you executed. Yeah. Now they at the end they were getting paid twenty five cents. Mm -hmm. So everything got squeezed. So you knew the writing was on the wall and and that's why so many people left. And a lot of people that left tried to do what, what, what I'm doing now. And it's, it's a total transformation. It's not easy. Um, it takes time. Uh, learning the market profile helped me tremendously. Mm -hmm. So um, I sat down with a good friend of mine back in 2011. I left the floor in 08, 07, the end of 07. Okay. I would have loved to have five more years, but the last two years were just torturous. Yeah. It was just so hard um, keeping everybody happy and, and, trying to trade against machines. So I left 
and I really just chilled out 2008, 2009. I started trading on my own 2010 and I'm trading all the old stocks I used to specialize in and I'm getting killed because I'm still making markets in them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Different, different skill set. Huh? With my money. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The spear leads are going sex money anymore. Yeah, no kidding. I knew I knew something's wrong here. And that's why I sat with my friend who had been trading behind the screen uh, since like 1998. Oh, okay. And I sat with him for almost a year in 2011. He taught me the profile. And then um, I started going out, you know, I came back home to, and started really getting proficient in it throughout 2012, 13, and up until now. Um, so... That's, that's how that transformation has happened. Now, it's certainly not as fun sitting here as it was on the floor. I mean, the oh. things you did, the people you met. Um, we, we used to have a visitor's gallery yep. where people actually came up on the floor. Uh, not on the floor, up in the visitor's gallery and could look over. Do you know what I'm yep. talking about? I, I was there, yeah. Okay. And my firm was right below it, so it was awesome. You could always look up and see people. Yep. <laughs> and you'd have people, you know, waving and this and that. One time this girl came on and she was very well endowed and decided to strip from the waist up against the glass and the entire floor is going absolutely nuts. And security's trying to get to us. She's all the way at the end of the visitors gallery and it was all packed and it was packed. So it took them a good two to three minutes to finally get her. Oh man, <laughs> so, uh, you know, oh, it, you don't see that sitting behind the screen anymore. Definitely uh, not. Definitely not. I mean, and I and I started in Vancouver just when the floor was ending, and you know, I remember some of those guys who came off the floor. I mean, there was a guy who sold beer on the floor. Uh, Vancouver was pretty loosey goosey. You know? Yeah, no, we didn't have that. I mean, no. <laughs> well, I'm sure in the 80s, and 90s, a lot of people walked uh, walked around stoned or, or high. <laughs> I added their face on the floor. I wouldn't doubt that. Oh, man. Yeah, that's funny. You, you, you had some spectators. You had women flashing you, Paul. You, you kind of uh, lived a little bit like an athlete, you know? Well, another, another thing, Ray, which was awesome. I mean, we met a lot. I mean, I met, I met uh, Reagan, President Reagan and President Bush down there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Met a tremendous amount of athletes, you know, who had come down with the Stanley Cup or the uh, World Series trophy, um, you know ton of actors and athletes, uh, actors and actresses, uh -huh. supermodels. They used to do the Victoria uh, Secret models would come down. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And, um, and we had a very funny guy that used to work with me and one of the funniest human beings I ever met. And he always carried a rubber chicken with him. <laughs> and he would take this rubber chicken wherever he was. Like he'd go on vacation. He'd go scuba diving with it. He'd go to the Himalayas with it. And he always made sure he got a picture with whoever came on the floor with this chicken. That's hilarious. And there's some very famous people uh, that have had their picture taken with uh, the rubber chicken. <laughs> That's um, great. Yeah. You know, you know, Paul, you know, I always thought like, uh, you know, I grew up playing sports myself. That was another thing. Oh, I wanted to be a football player. That's what I think what's so great about trading and like what I think one of the reasons I gravitated to poker, it's the, the competition, right? It's still kind of an athlete, a, a, uh, an outlet for that type. Right. You know what I mean? So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know now, I mean, as I've gotten older, you know, that's one of the few jobs I could yell, scream and stamp my feet like a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we did. We just yelled and screamed all day. Not that because we were yelling and screaming because we were trading. Exactly. And you know, it was, it was controlled chaos though. Many people would come down and say, well, how do you know what's going on? And so you tune everything else out except what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it really was controlled chaos, we call it. And the fact now that I think about it, there's no way I could have sat behind a desk all my life. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So um, you're right, Ray. It, it was it was a great outlet for that for that type of uh, for that type of thing for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed when when we brought a lot of the guys in from the floor to uh, to the offices, it was like caging animals. You know, they, they just walk around the office all the time and they'd always be, they'd kind of like, you know, basically make circles of the desk all the time because they exactly. just, they couldn't sit at a chair, you know? Yeah. And, and I see, so I was a specialist. I stood, so picture the trading floor. You had those, the trading posts, the round trading posts, and yep. the specialists would stand in front of those. And then the floor brokers would walk, do, do all the walking. 
Yeah. I had some guys that used to walk around and, and they walked like 10 miles a day. They kept track of it. <laughs> and when we needed them, we had a thing called the pager system. So everybody had a badge number, right? So I was 2724. That's the name of my, you know, I'm kind yeah. of trading 2724. That was my badge number. All specialists had a two. And then I used 724 as my oldest daughter, my oldest daughter's birthday. So I was 2724. Oh. And we would use those pages to type in somebody's badge number if we needed them at our post. Okay. So that's how they would come to us, um, you know, to say, uh, hey, you are a buyer in this stock. I have a large seller here. See if your guy has any more interest. You yeah. No, yeah, no, that's that. And that's a d different way of, of doing business now because, you know, that, that, that time that you could, you know, take to find a buyer mm -hmm. um, is gone now. So that's why, you know, things just collapse so quickly. Um, you know, the, it, it just takes that, uh, you know, of course, instantaneous execution is one thing, but, you know. Well, again, if we didn't do that, so say, you know, for argument's sake, uh, and I keep coming up with firms that aren't around anymore. I have Bear Stearns in my head. <laughs> But, you know, whoever, you know, Bear Stearns came in, uh, was a buyer in one of my stocks the previous day. He bought 2 million shares. Mm -hmm. Now, the next day, you know, he checks the stock, and but he says, I don't have anything right now. Well, if a huge seller comes in, and I start knocking his stock down without putting up his badge number and say, hey, this, this guy has size for sale. See if you guy has an interest. You have to do your due diligence. Yeah. I didn't do that, and the stock went down $3. His trader on the desk would go through the phone and you know, go nuts at me. Oh, yeah. You should have given me the heads up. Yeah. You know, do you have an interest? In, there is no accountability whatsoever anymore. And, and obviously, you see it in how these markets um, trade. So, Yeah, definitely. And do you think, I mean, so you were a part of, of Spear Leads when Goldman bought them. That yeah. must have been an incredible change in the culture. Oh, it was. Um, so my firm, my little firm split up. There were a lot of personality issues in 1996. Some of them stayed on their own. Some of them went to LeBranch and company. You've heard of them. Oh right? yeah, definitely. Yeah. That was it. And four of us, including me went to Spear Leeds. Oh, okay. In 1996. And it was, that was a different culture right off the bat. Uh, these guys didn't know me from a hole in the wall. I, I, I didn't like it at first. I did okay. not like it at all. And then I sat down with one of the head guys at Spear Leeds, and they gave me a very, very difficult stock to trade. Remember Bay Networks? Yes. So Bay Networks at the time was a huge competitor of Cisco. Mm -hmm. And it had come over from the NASDAQ, and whoever traded it for us was having a very difficult time trading it. So they gave it to me. <laughs> and I actually did very well in it, which really kind of made my name – you know, over at Spear Leeds and, you know, put me in the uh, upper light with management. Oh, so that really helped. And then in 2000, I guess it was Goldman Sachs. I mean, Goldman Sachs, they were looking, I don't know if Goldman Sachs was actually looking at, at all of Spear Leeds. They were looking at different um, branches of us, I think. They ended up taking the whole package and that was night and day. I mean, we went from, you got to realize, we were very politically incorrect on the floor. <laughs> however, however, it was never, ever, ever done in a malicious manner. Oh, I know. Right, right. Yeah. It was to blow off steam. Look, I'm, I'm Lebanese, okay? Um, I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm Lebanese. I've never been to Lebanon. I was born here. My parents were born here. <laughs> however, during the, during the Gulf War, if you remember, do you remember the deck of cards with all of the... Uh, um, yes. Uh, well, yes. Saddam Hussein was the ace of spades. They made me the ace of spades. <laughs> I, I didn't get upset at that, you know. So, so but there was incredible political uh, incorrect, you know, oh. down there. But again, it was never done maliciously. And like I said, it was a great community. And everybody would always help each other. Oh yeah. Uh, when Goldman Sachs took us over, boy, did that stop. Uh, oh boy, yeah. We probably had a meeting the first week saying there is no more of calling this one that or this one that. <laughs> really? Oh, because they were. It happened know, that early. Okay. Oh, wow. yeah, because they knew the history of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> they knew it. Um, and they had to nip it in the bud real quick. We literally had a meeting. The entire unit from the trading floor 
I had to go and sit and um, listen to this two hour uh, thing on how we have to treat our fellow people. <laughs> Well, I mean, coming, I mean, I, I come from the, dealing with the boys in Jersey City, the market makers. And, right. I mean, we used to insult the, I mean, a racial slur was like how you'd end the phone call. They used to call me steroid Gandhi, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> steroid so, Gandhi. Yeah. You know, and it'd be like, but it was like, you know, you're filled steroid Gandhi, right? You know, that, you know, we'd, everybody had a nickname. There was bloated Gary. And, oh, of course. You know, it was like. <laughs> of course. You know. But and again, it was, it was never done maliciously, and and I understand. Yeah, you know, know, now we're talking to, as time went on, you know, more and more of uh, the, the political correctness uh, started taking place everywhere. Obviously, um, you know, I had three daughters. I would never, never say anything nasty to a woman yeah. or anything. Yeah, I do. Whether I was with Goldman Sachs or not, I would not. Yeah, that's true. And but you know you live to deal, you live to learn with it, and you know their culture change, especially when they started putting some Goldman Sachs people in charge of our unit. Um, you know, we, you know we were used to at four o'clock the bell rang. I was looking to go home by four or five. Yeah, that's yeah. not Goldman Sachs's uh, culture. Yeah. So like we'd have some meetings sometimes and we'd have to go to their office and we'd be sitting there at five o'clock and be like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> this is horrible. And then the meeting would end at five 30 and everybody else from Goldman Sachs see us going home. They go, well, where are you going? We're like, we're going home. They're like, Oh, we're going back to our desk. We'll probably be here till eight. I'm like, Oh, oh. yeah. Like, you know, so it's definitely a different culture, but it's a great firm. They were, you know, they were good. Yeah. They were good with us. Um, they're still still one of the best out there. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it must be very different too, because I mean, you started, you know, so early when when firms were still partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to public companies. So, you know, from a risk perspective, I mean, when they were partnerships, you had like. I don't know, 20 or 30 really old savage men who are extremely smart and extremely cheap, they'd sit around and they'd protect their capital. Right. Yes. Um, you know, and now it's, I think they, they kind of play a little fast and loose with shareholder money. You know? Well, no, because again, there's nobody really, there's, there's nobody really, I think that's held accountable to any, to any, to any company or any exchange or anything really. I mean, I know, look, I still have friends that work on the floor. Yeah. My, there's still like 15 or 16 people left in my old firm. Um, they're owned, I believe, by a high frequency trading firm. You know, most of their orders are put in, I think, from upstairs where they make bids and offers and support the stock. Oh, okay. But it's still it's still not the same because you got to realize the order flow. And again, I have no idea what the numbers are. But if we were 95% of the order flow that went through, say, IBM at the time, maybe it's 50 or 40 percent now mm -hmm. and out of that where we were 30 percent of our own money maybe it's five or six percent yeah so it, it's definitely changed um but uh you know they're still down there some of them are still still doing okay um it's it's not the same vibrant vibrant place it was but you know, hopefully for their sake it stays open i mean you know it's been closed now if i guess about two weeks it has been yeah and yeah, they, I you know I, I hope they reopen it and bring it back a little bit. It's uh, you know it's you know every Christmas you see Art Cashin and the people on the floor and things like that. It's you know that's kind of a it's kind of a cool thing. I'm a big Wall Street history person, so I'd I'd hate to see that disappear. I think the fact that CNBC has their studio there will help because CNBC doesn't want to be um, operating out of a, out of a room that there's nobody trading from anymore. You know. Yeah. Yeah. What separates you from NASDAQ then? Exactly. So I think, I think they will go back. Um, I hope they go back. It'll be nice. Like I said, I have some uh, good people that I'm still friendly with down there. You know, Arthur Cashin's a great guy. I know Arthur for many, many years. Um, so I, I think it will come back. We'll see. It, it's, a, it's a matter of time. We'll see what happens with that. That's great. Ray, you uh yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I got some questions, of course. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, why, why is your primary focus uh, the SPY? Be uh, that's a great question. Because when I left the trading floor and I started trading on my own in 2010, like I said, I was trading all my stocks and getting killed. Mm -hmm. When I went and sat with my friend, he said, 
you know, he kind of like did a trick question with me. He goes, how many stocks do you want to trade? I said, I don't know, three or five. And then he showed me the kind of time, effort, and work we're going to put into it. And he said, now how many do you want to do? I said, one. <laughs> so uh, he goes, what do you want to trade? I said, you know what? I said, I've never traded the SPY. Um, I said, it's, it's one of the best, biggest vehicle out there. It's, it's, it encompasses the best part of the market. It's liquid. Um, it's got great uh, um, ranges. So I'm like, let's try that. That's why I picked the SPY. Okay. And, 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 and I yeah. trade the ETF and the options. I've never traded futures before. And a lot of people keep asking, why don't I? And the best answer I can give to that is because I, I, I'm very good at doing what I know, and that's trading the ETF and the options. I mean, it might take me a while to trade the futures and get good at it, but you know, at this stage of the game, I'm like, I want to stick with what I know. Right, right. So market, user market profile, what, where did your edge come from using profile? Well, I liked – I like to describe the profile. I love, I, I'm very, I've gotten very adept at breaking down charts. And when I look at a chart, to me, a chart is an x-ray, right? Mm -hmm. So the monthly, weekly, daily, 30 minute, it's like looking at an x-ray. When you look at the market profile, it's like looking at an MRI. Mm -hmm. It's night and day. Right, Markets yeah. are very, very visual. It's not a science. It's an art. And to me, every day, it's like a new canvas every day when that profile starts ticking off in A period. And it really, really, when you start to learn it and get in tune with it, it paints a beautiful picture for you. And, I, and it gives me a huge, huge advantage, um, I think, against people who don't use profile. Right. Um, you know, today, on a, you know, today was a pretty slow day, but it gave some great opportunities. The profile mm -hmm. gave some great opportunities. I mean, we had higher value all day. So when the market sold off midday in, in H period, I was looking for an afternoon pullback low, which I like to buy. Bought it in H, made a new high. You know, things like that. Uh, we never traded below the open. We stayed out of last week's range. Yeah, you can see that on a 30-minute chart, but you're not going to see it the same way as you see it in the profile, how the volume tape is off Yeah. Uh, and, and things like that. You know, we, were, we only got eight wide in the profile. But that's important to me. The point of control is very important. You're never going to see that on a 30 minute job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yep, yep, yep. So exactly. it paints a really, really nice picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess while we're talking about the uh, profile, mm -hmm. uh, you said something interesting to me before we got on the 350 algo mm -hmm. in M period. You just want to kind of just br like briefly go over that? Because I, I found that interesting. Uh, sure. So M period is its own little. <laughs> uh, we call it Lady M. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I told you earlier, for the most part, I try not to trade M period because that's one period that's going to distort the profile a lot of time. Right, right. If I've had a good day, I try to stay away from it. If I've had a bad day, I really don't want to try to get my money back in it. However, there are times, and today, today was one of them, where M period sets up. M period has a habit lately – it usually uh, even uh, takes out L's high or low and, and usually goes only the one way. Recently, it's taken out both L's low and high. Did not do that today. Mm -hmm. But there is a thing at around at exactly 350 that's been happening recently and in this volatile market has been more exasperated where you're getting some huge move off a 350 algorithm. Now, when the market's up, it's generally an up move and vice versa when the market's down. So today, when the market pulled back a little bit in M period, I got long because I thought the odds of the 350 algo taking out the day's high would be very good. And it's exactly what it did. Now, today, it only went up, I think, a buck 40, I said, Ray. I forgot what I said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was, and believe it or not, I still have my market profile up. Yeah, but it happened, it happened quickly, though, right, Paul? Like in it happened a, in a minute. Right, right. In a minute. I forgot what day it was. Um, we went up five uh, four dollars in one minute at three fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. And it was a day where the market was rallying, and I, I took a, that time it had come in. I took a pretty sizable position, bought a hundred calls, mm -hmm. and it went up. Four, the, the stock went up four dollars in literally a minute, and I sold the options up over a dollar. Beautiful. And, and, and so 
it's something to keep an eye on. The other thing I said in M period, as somebody else had mentioned to me, usually where M period opens up, you generally migrate back to where it opened at some point in M period. Right, right. That's, you know, it's little, little nuances to keep an eye on. Definitely, definitely not. And this, this is why I love talking to different people because yeah, you pick up these different, like you said, nuances or certain people catch certain things that I miss. I'm definitely going to keep that going forward. Um, so how much of an edge, Paul, do you, do you think people of your background coming off the floor or, you know, people who've had, like JJ, people who've had experience in the industry, how much of an edge do you think that gives you guys versus someone of like my background or other retail trader backgrounds who don't come from the industry? I think the biggest edge it probably gives me in is my is my demeanor and and trying to remain calm. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. From getting hurt a lot. I mean, you know, I, there were days on the floor I, I was out. You know, I was long million or two million shares and out three four million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. You you had you tried not to wear your position on your sleeves. <laughs> right. There were times you did, and you would take it oh. out on your clerk or you took it out on a broker. <laughs> but for the most part, whether you're up big or down big, the true, the true professional is going to try not to show. Yeah. Yeah, like poker. You know that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's easier said than done now because like, I'm thinking about this, Paul. You're, you're from New York. A guy, mm -hmm. a guy from Brooklyn. Like, uh, how did you uh, – see, for me, that's been my hardest thing. Well, not, not so bad now. You know, not, now I'm like down the line. I'm experienced. But I'm an emotional person by nature. So am I. Right, right. So <laughs> I assume that I'm assuming. Yeah. So how do you deal? Like, like, well, how did, how was that learning curve for you? Um, well, like I, I smashed many a keyboard on the floor, to, <laughs> on, on the floor to trade. I would have to call over the technician and he'd see 30 keys laying on the floor. He goes, what happened? I said, oh, I fell. But anyway, <laughs> so over time, as you get older, I think experience has, yeah. has helped me learning my craft behind the screen, right? So on the floor, as I got more and more experienced and better at what I did, I got less and less upset if I was losing money. Right, right. Okay, same thing behind the screen now. You, you try, okay, am I, am I going to be stubborn and hold a position? Well, then I can't get upset at myself. Um, or am I going to get out of it and start over? So I think experience is huge right. um, as far as dealing with it. I don't know if there's so much of an advantage from what I did to somebody who never did it, maybe understanding the market a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if we're basically starting off behind the screen, it's, it's really different animals from what I did. So there's not that much of an advantage, um, I don't think, uh, according to that. Right. But once you learn your craft and learn tempo, maybe another advantage is tempo. You used to yeah. sense tempo on the floor of the exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have the same – crescendo when people are getting loud and, and thing, mm. but you still feel, you can still see the tempo picking up or, or, yeah. le or decreasing even behind the screen. That's it. That's interesting. You know, like, cause that's something me and JJ talked about and uh, it, it's hard, like, cause he can feel like you guys can probably feel certain things that I can't, you know? And like, that's what I told him. You can't teach feel Paul. You know what I mean? No, but the longer you do it, the, right with experience yeah mm -hmm. we'll pick it up i mean it took me a while even behind the screen but you know today's a perfect example i had guys asking me well why are you long we were one time framing down an h period and i said i'm long here and they're like well why are you long i'm like because the tempo is horrible yeah. on the downside right. we have higher value we're above the opening the indices are all up big yeah. i said the odds everything's about odds in trading Absolutely. anybody who tells you hey we're going here we're going there <laughs> we're all of it. yeah yeah. Or they tell you they never lose money. Ugh. That's that's bull. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're dealing with Paul. We're dealing with probabilities, not certainties. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The best, like I tell the guys in my trading room, the best I could give you are the best odds of this trade being successful. Right. And right. that was that trade was based on really more tempo than anything else, and and it worked out beautifully. Mm -hmm. So great. great, great. So, so Paul, how would you describe your style as a trader? I guess as far as it could be uh, time period, maybe yep. your I, yeah, go ahead. No, I I think recently, especially since I've been in trading the trading room over the past year, it's become more scalper because it's been harder as I'm trying to talk and trade at the same time. Okay. To just I I, I would there are a lot of times 
I would like to hold for, you know, for a one time frame and up and I'm long, hold it and, and keep adding to my position as we go higher instead of taking it off. Uh-huh. So I, I like to say I'm still that type of trader, but I've done that less over the past year. And that's, I think, because I'm more involved with typing and talking and trading. Yeah. It's a so lot. It, it, it is a lot and it's yeah. made it a little harder. So I, I've been more of a scalper. In this type of market, though, Ray, there's no doubt I wanted to be a scalper. Like when <laughs> during February and March, oh jeez, I decreased my size tremendously. Like during the summer months, I was I was trading sometimes with three, four hundred contracts <laughs> because my risk was was minimal because I knew I had to get as much gain as I can because the, we had ranges of less than a dollar for the day. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. I know. Oh my God. So, but now I w- I've been only playing with between 10, 20, 30 contracts, but you know yeah. what, when you're moving $4, that adds up. Yeah. Absolutely. So my style's changed based on volatility. I'm trading smaller lots. Now that we've gotten a little quieter, I would like to start expanding uh, my size more in my mm-hmm. trades. And since we know who we're trading against, start holding on to my trades longer. Right. Right. <clears throat> All right. Good stuff. So Paul, how was it trying, you, I know you're a family man. So how was it raising a family and like balancing that with working on the floor? Uh, well, I had a great wife. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, if you ask her how many diapers I changed, it probably wasn't a lot. Um, she, she was great with that. Uh, I always, I was, I was an early to bed guy when I worked on the floor. Mm-hmm. I went, to, you know, I needed my sleep and I was also in, in early. I commuted, whether it was from Brooklyn or then when I moved out to New Jersey, I was usually at my desk in the office by 7 a.m. Wow. I, wanted, I wanted to beat the traffic. We always had meetings starting around eight o'clock. So, I mean, I was leaving my house at 6 a.m. every day. So, um, she was great. You know, I wanted to go to bed at nine o'clock. I went to bed at nine o'clock. Uh, you know, my girls were very young. Even when I left the floor, my two youngest were five and seven when I left the trade. Oh, school. okay. That's good. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. which was awesome. And, right. You know, so I was spent a lot of time with them then. Um, but, uh, I, I was lucky. It was also, I was very, you know, I had a wife that, you know, look, we went out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, Thursday night, we were out every Thursday night. Nice. Um, and a lot of times we stayed in the city Thursday night. <laughs> so, um, or there were times I would take a car home and get home at two o'clock in the morning, three hours later, I'm going back. Yeah. So, um, but it, you know, she understood that we needed our, we, we took our clients, yeah. we took our clients out a lot. We had to meet our companies a lot. And plus we just wanted to go out and chill out. Right. Right. That's so, great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Back, back to trading for a second, Paul. I forgot mm-hmm. that. This is what I want to ask you because you see, you seem, you seem to me maybe a little bit more on the aggressive end when it comes to trading. Like this is something I always think of, right? Like balancing being aggressive and trying mm-hmm. to really capitalize on opportunity without yeah. being reckless. Have you put thought to this, like, or, or how would you you think you would fall on the scale? I think I am. I'm not reckless. I get stubborn. Okay. Um, I there are times. Um, I'll take a big, I'll take a big position when I feel the market is about to do something, even if it's not, not going to happen, you know, like on those slow days, um, you know, for you know, argument's sake today, after I took that long in H period, we started going up in I and I added on to it. Now I didn't add a lot onto it because I'm teaching everything, but that would be the type of trade where if I was long 20, 30 contracts, I might've bought a hundred more there. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm because the odds of us going to where I thought it was going to go were very good at that point. So I don't think I'm reckless in that sense. I do get stubborn. Okay. As look, my biggest adage is don't fade a trend day. Yeah. Don't fade. Yeah. I've faded trend days many a time. So it's some personal experience of getting absolutely crushed mm-hmm. every time we kept going up. I'm like, no, it's got to come in. Mm-hmm. So that's from experience. So, mm-hmm. um, you can call that uh, uh, being reckless, and it is. I like calling it stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are days that I've gone home with that position, and then two days later, I was right, or two days later, I lost even more. I mean, you know, and then so you, it's, it's all from experience. I, I don't think I'm a reckless trader. 
um, I can get stubborn at times. Though. I can get stubborn. Okay. Since you brought up the trend days, right? Because I think, I think, Jay, this is even something we brought up to today. Like, like it's, it's hard sometimes to, to jump in, right? Once, oh. the, once the trade's already left. It, oh, yeah. It's, it, it's especially when they do the, you know, two periods up and then they pull the plug. Um, you know, and, and they've been doing that. You don't get a pure trend day right off the bat. You know, and uh, so it, it is harder trusting it. Right, you know? right. So, Paul, do you, is it almost like, do, do we just like simplify it, right? Like, hey, don't just don't fade it. Just get in. Just just, just go with it. Almost like, hey, don't over overthink it. Like, how do you how do you treat a trend day then? When you know you're in a trend day. And to me, to, for a trend day, I need single prints. Now, there's a lot of traders out there. A lot of singles. You're, if you're just one time framing up, they consider a trend day. And again, any whatever works for anybody works uh, it's, it's an art it's not a science it's not one mm -hmm. plus one but we haven't believe it or not in this entire move down and even back up we haven't had many trend days yeah i know it's weird At all. Mm -hmm. yeah I, we had one i have a set of single prints from um, what day is it the eighth we had three sets of single prints that day that's right we only, yeah we only ended with yeah. one but if you get a day when you have three, four, five sets of single prints, oh, yeah. and you're just one time framing up, you just have to go with it. You just gotta go with it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was agreeing with you. That, that that's that's always been my. It's just like, hey, if we we recognize it, just going in. Don't don't overcomplicate it. The the, the, the singles are holding. That. And to me, Paul, I think that's one of the best things about the profile is the, the single prints, or or maybe the most reliable. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's fascinating to me how that the the market just loves to fill. The singles, or if it holds, if it holds, you yeah. got to be wrong. Right, you right. have to be wrong because even if the singles fill and you're still one time framing up, I would say you still have to be wrong. That's your yeah. right because they'll fill yeah. and bounce. They do that little the fill, uh, yeah, yep. the fill yeah. and bounce, yeah. yeah. Especially when you're dealing with short term traders and these oh. algorithms, they, they it's like a heat seeking missile. <laughs> <laughs> they, fill, yes. they fill the single print, yet they won't take out the prior time frames low. Yeah. And then they go right back up. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's all part of feel. Like, like even today, you know, when we made newer highs, but you can tell we're already six wide. The odds of a trend day, and I said this in my room, I said the odds of a trend day were getting less and less. So now I was looking to fade new highs and sell it. Mm -hmm. Because the odds of it coming back into the day's balance was very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. These are all things you learn and, 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 and sense as you yeah. learn no, definitely. I, I think market auction theory, I think it's, it's a very digestible way to understand uh, or to see the market and how it's interacting. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I think for people just, just new to the game, I think that's probably the best way to get your footing, even if it's not something you stick with. Uh, definitely. And even for people who trade equities, let me jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've been looking at equities. I, I you know, I, you know, I've taken a couple of hundred companies public uh, with reverse mergers and stuff like that and traded out so much order flow, but I never even knew this existed. Now I look at a stock with a profile and you can see because, you know, equities, the supply is controlled by the, the large holders. Mm -hmm. So you can see when they completely shut off the sell, you know, you see poor low, poor low, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're moving back up. It, it's really, it, it's, it's sometimes it's so, it's just, it's, you know, it basically slaps you and tells you not to short, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and your mental I mean I tell all new traders this your mental reserve is just as important as your capital reserve oh, no, boy. Yeah. no kidding I've had days where I battled a position because I was stubborn mm -hmm. and either got it all back or lost and then you know I get out of the position say at 2 o'clock there's no way I could take another trade yeah right. Just not. right that's very important mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely good stuff I mean that's that's it for me, Paul. Um, Jay, anything else? Uh, no, that's pretty much it for me. Just really, really happy that uh, I got to talk. I spent quite a bit of time with him and then didn't get to spend time with Paul, so it's really nice to reconnect. And uh, It is. I appreciate you guys having me. Um, I might, If you don't mind, I want to throw a shout-out to my, to my room and, and, and where um, people can find me if they'd like. Mm -hmm. So I have a website. You would go to... Uh, camelbacktrading.org right and if you want you could sign up there i have it's it's really it's really cheap it's 20 dollars a month or 200 annually 
once you sign up, you have to download the Discord channel, right? The Discord app, and then I send you a link to join. So that's camelbacktrading.org. I'm on Twitter at Paul Asmo and the number five. And I'm also on YouTube. I put all my videos on YouTube. Just look up under Paul Asma, A-S-M-A-R. And I do a morning video at around 8.45 and a recap at around 4.15. So I'm trying to build up that base. Uh, have a nice following. It's a good bunch of people. And uh, again, I enjoy teaching. I love trading. I enjoy teaching it. So doing this today and doing everything I'm doing is, is giving me uh, uh, great pride. Great. Good stuff. Go check them out, everybody. Check them out. So with that, that's going to conclude today's episode of Confessions of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, uh, please rate and review it for us. Um, if you guys are interested in learning market profile as well, we have a room. Um, we also trade uh, what, oil in there. There's people trading equities, building a good group of people. That's at microefutures.com. Paul, once again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, JJ. It's great seeing you. Uh, listening uh, to you guys and talking to you. I appreciate it. Yes, great. absolutely. Great speaking to you again. All right. And so for Paul, he's the gorilla. <laughs> I'm Lulu. You guys have a good day. You stop, okay. so. <laughs> good night, everyone. Good night.